Hey folks, I thought you might get a kick out of this story. This is a short video. This is an excerpt from a Twitch stream in which we talk about the one time I played in the Middle Earth role-playing game. This is the first, I believe, official Lord of the Rings RPG made by Iron Crown Enterprises. And the writing um, in these books, like the research they would do when they were expanding on Tolkien's Legendarium, and coming up with backstories for, for instance, all the Nazgul, or like in this book, you get to read all about the wizards and the Istari, and they had to invent a lot of stuff, and it was incredibly high quality, I thought. And I think it's probably still interesting to read for people who are fans of The Lord of the Rings. There is a running the game style lesson in here, although really it's a playing the game lesson because it's a story about a problem player. I think it's pretty common at a lot of tables, and it, the only interesting thing about it is in this instance, the problem player was me. And we also talk about my introduction to the kind of the depth of Tolkien's Legendarium when we played in my friend Brad's older brother Matt's D&D game where he borrowed a lot of stuff from the Silmarillion and stuck it in his game. That was a lot of fun. You'll hear me talk about a class in the Middle Earth RPG called the Jack of All Trades. Um, I misremembered that. There is no such class. I was playing a bard. But this is not really a class-based system. It's a, a skill-based system, which means everybody has access to the same quite broad list of skills. And the only difference between one class and another was which bonuses you got to which skills. It's kind of a classic skill-based system. I just thought you might get a kick out of this story. If not, no big deal. It's a short video and you're going to get quite a long video. Like I'd like a 20 minute plus video next week. The title of which is What Are Dungeons For? Which is really about styles of play. And I think that is going to prompt quite a lot of discussion. But in the meantime, here's my story about the first time I played in the Middle Earth role playing game. So my, my Middle Earth story. Um, Middle, my Middle Earth role-playing story. So I think it was, we were probably nine, somewhere between 19 and 21 uh, when my friend Brad, my, uh, my, probably the, the DM, I have spent most of my life trying to emulate. Not my first DM. Um, he decided to run a Merp game. And because, I mean, he was big into Middle Earth. Really, his older brother was big into Middle Earth. I played, remember the Earth Elemental steps on your head to make sure you're dead? That was Brad's brother, Matt. And it was kind of a treat for him to run for us when Matt ran for us. It was one campaign. We played a couple of times. It was very cool because that guy was a 70s player. And he was one of those people that had built a very elaborate mythology for his world, but it was also very synthetic. Meaning, I don't mean synthetic as in like artificial. I mean like synthesized from multiple different sources. So he, so it was Matt, uh, it was Brad's older brother, Matt, who had stolen a lot of really hardcore noodly Middle Earth shit and stuck it into his game. Um, like, I think that was the first, I think it was Matt's game was the first time I'd ever heard the term my R, right? Because I was one of them in his game. It is a D and D game, mind you, but he had a rule where if, um, you're, if, if you're, if you had certain stats that had to be certain, certain stats in D and D had to be really high. David Park guitar. Hello. If you, so it's one of those things where if you're, if you're, Int is this high, it might have just been your three um, mental stats, if they were all above a certain level, there was a chance that you were descended from the Maiar. I, I remember rolling a 98 to find out if I was a Maiar or not. And he's like, yep, and I didn't know what that was. And he was like, it's like what Gandalf was in Lord of the Rings. I was like, oh, fuck. And he goes, but like, imagine if Gandalf had sex with people 10 generations ago. Well, it's been, that bloodline has been watered down a lot. Right. And you're, you're what's left. And that kind of fucking blew my mind. I was like the idea of Gandalf, you know, or, or one of those characters having, um, intercourse with, um, a human and having that intercourse produce, um, offspring or issue as they would have called it kind of fucking blew my mind. I was like, oh, that's cool as shit. Um, and, and the way he represented that, because obviously like in, in middle earth, which we weren't playing, this was a D and D game in middle earth, Gandalf is one of the only people that can do magic. Um, he, not, not only Astari can do magic, there are sorcerers and magicians and stuff like that. Um, and I think the implication is that like magicians are like charlatans, but they can do a little magic, a little like hedge wizard magic, but then they use that to kind of puff uh, themselves up. But there were like sorcerers and stuff like the mouth of Sauron, one of the black Numenorians. So yeah, I was one of the, and the way Matt contextualize that in D and D where normal everyday people can do things like cast magic missile, right? You take, you take, you know, 
you get one experience point and suddenly you're a first level character and you can learn magic missile, right? So in the world of D&D, what percentage of people in the population could do this? A lot. Well, then what do you do in D&D if you want to make somebody the special weird thing that Gandalf was? He gave me psionics, right? Because the psionics rules in AD&D were very weird. They were very weird and esoteric and very science fictional, right? Um, and so I, my, my character had psionics and that's what made him, that's what made him different. So Matt's D and D campaign was very heavily influenced by, um, the appendices to the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion, not so much the actual events of Lord of the Rings. So that was one of my first exposures to this deep lore of middle earth. And I was like, this is fucking cool. Well, then when Brad ran his D and D campaign, he literally just took his brother's game and added the black company on top of it. Right. So everybody that every generation that ran it added their own thing to it. And you got these layers of time and history, which was very cool. And then Brad decided he wanted to run Middle Earth. All right, cool. So we made characters. And I believe the way it worked is it's um, I think I'm, I'm going to get the core rules for this. There's probably a PDF online I could read where you are. It's a random. It's random generation, I believe. And I rolled in. I rolled stupidly high for my stats. It's a percentile system. So like my lowest stat was like a 76. Right. And then you choose your ancestry and your ancestry layers some numbers on top of that. And then you choose your class and your class layers some numbers on top of that. So I had several stats above 100 on a percentile system. Right. Which meant that like I had to. But but, it, you know, 100 is not, you know, you, you, there is like my role and then the difficulty. So that still meant I was going to be failing. You know, everyone else was going to be failing um, 65% of the time. And I was going to be failing 45% of the time, still a big difference, but not night and day. Right. So these, it's a, the, 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 you gotta kind of, you gotta understand the system to understand why having stats over hundred is not that big a deal. Um, and I noticed that one of the classes was, I think the name of it was actually Jack of all trades was the name of the class. I could be wrong because I just looked at a bunch of classes here and none of them are called that. Um, but there might be a reason for that. This might have been, I think this might have been Merp second edition, so they might have introduced this. I've got a little bit of an eye twitch here. Um, so I was like, I had this idea. I don't know where I came up with it, where with if I play the Jack of all trades uh, class, I could sort of, because my stats were so good. So the Jack of all trades class, it doesn't give you a huge bonus in any skill, but it gives you lots of bonuses and little skills. That makes sense. It gives you a lot, this is a lot, lot every, every RPG has a class like this, right? The skill monkey is what they often call it. Um, so I was like, this is cool. I could be a little bit of everything. And also part of me, I was 17, 18, 19 years old. Part of me was like, if I roll well, if I roll well, then it would be like I was every class because my stats are super high. My class is giving me bonuses to all these different things. And so I spent my money on, um, uh, like I bought a horse, I bought a suit of plate. No, I bought, a, I bought a horse, I bought a suit of chain mail. I bought a suit of leather armor. I asked the DM, could I get it blacked? Could I get it blacked like um, oil or something? He's like, yeah, sure, you can do that, no problem. I'm like, cool. And I had the I had the leather armor stowed in my pack, my horse's saddlebags, and um, I had a long sword, I had a shield, I had a I had a bow, um, I had a dagger, right? And so I ride into town, and the adventure gets started, and my and, and I took my character sheet and I flipped it over, so that all it said on this side was my name and my physical description. And, and everyone's like, what, what are you playing? And I'm like, I'm like, what do you mean playing? I'm not playing anything. What do you mean? Are we going to play, we play dice. We're going to play cards. And I was just role playing, right? Um, in the most annoying way possible. This is a really cool idea, but of course I'm, I'm fulsome in my powers at this point in my life. And I was just, you know, you know, I, I was, it was a very abusive way to approach a tabletop, uh, RPG, but I was not going to speak out of character. I was going to do the whole thing in character. And, and everybody at the table was like, when they realized what I was doing, they were like, cool. Except one friend of mine who, um, at the time I thought he was just being a dick. But now I realize I was the one being a dick. He was the one being like, why you gotta like, we're, this is not that kind of game, dude. We're not that kind of group. We've known each other now for seven years. Why are you trying to pretend like, you know, like it, to a certain extent, Matt, you're kind of ruining our fun and we know you can enjoy playing our way. So what are you doing? But we didn't have the, we didn't have the language for that. Um, uh, so, so we were at loggerheads and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being at loggerheads about this. Right. And, um, 
Well, actually, I was treating it like role-playing, I think, Levi Phipps. And so uh, he was like, what, what class are you? I'm like, what, what class? I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not a noble, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> it drove him crazy. And he really wanted to see my character sheet. And I wouldn't let him see it, right? No, absolutely, Joe V2. Maybe you're not ruining the fun, but you're kind of holding it hostage on your terms. Yes, I have seen that in many RPG groups where there's one player who's a little bit broader in their interest, right? They can enjoy playing lots of different ways. They see, every group I've been in has had at least one player who can see the possibilities of the RPG, the concept of the RPG, and really want to go for it, right? Um, and the problem is not everybody else wants to, and you kind of got to pick a tone for your table. I don't mean you're necessarily, but your table has to, you kind of have to agree on what kind of role players are we? Otherwise, you're just going to get annoyed with each other. Um, So I was kind of being a dick. I was kind of, as, um, as Joe V2 correctly puts out, you weren't, maybe you weren't ruining the fun, but you were kind of holding it hostage on your terms. Yes. But I wouldn't do that now. That's the point of being 17, 18, 19 is, you know, when else are you going to be a complete dick much? It's somewhat consequence free at that stage. And so what happened was there was a, there was a, an encounter at the beginning of the adventure in which I was the kind of chain mail for a first level character it was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. Um, so that meant I was one of the most heavily armed people there. And my friend, my friend was like, because I came in on a horse and I think I might even have had a lance. And because I was wearing chain and I had a shield and sword, he goes, oh, you're a cavalier. Okay, cool. That's fine. And, and it was like, I figured you out. Now I don't care about your nonsense anymore. And I was like, okay, cool. He thinks I'm a cavalier. That's fine. Um, and then some shit went down at night. Some shit went down that night while we were all in uh, the, and we're not a party yet. We're kind of feeling ourselves out. Um, blimey. And, uh, so some shit is going down in the town and the other players go out to investigate. And this is kind of how they're going to become a, a team. And I don't, I switch to my, my blackened leather armor and I get, and I, I, I put camo on my face, you know, not, you know, mud or something. And I get my bow and my dagger and I go up onto the roof. Okay. Make a climb check. 135. Okay. Make a stealth check. 126. Right. And at this point, my friend is going fucking insane. He's like, what the fuck are you? Because I was basically in that first encounter, I was acting like I was a cavalier. In this encounter, I'm acting like I'm a. Scout. Scout. Right. And uh, then later on, I revealed what I was. I was a jack of all trades that just rolled incredibly high so I could pull all this shit off. And that was my experience with the middle of role 